Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming in um, to our uh, third medical education grand rounds for the uh, academic year. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Greeson. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Greeson is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology, College of Science and Mathematics at Rowan University. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology at Swarthmore College and his Master's in Science in Biomedical Chemistry at Thomas Jefferson University. He then completed his PhD in Clinical Psychology at the University of Miami, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in Health Psychology at Duke University. Dr. Greeson directs the Mindfulness, Stress, and Health Lab, an interdisciplinary research program that integrates psychology with health, medicine, and basic science. Trained as a clinical health psychologist, his primary research interest is the effect of stress on mental and physical health and how mindfulness can lower stress and reduce the risk of stress-related disease. His research, which utilizes psychophysiology, neuroscience, omics, and patient-reported outcomes, has been continuously funded by the NIH for 15 years, for over 15 years. Dr. Greeson is currently a fellow of the Institute of, for Integrated Health. As a licensed psychologist, he provides psychotherapy and mindfulness training to adults who are dealing with stress-related conditions, ranging from anxiety, depression, and insomnia to hypertension, HIV, and chronic pain. He has over 50 peer-reviewed publication, publications and has given over 100 invited presentations to students researchers, and healthcare professionals. Dr. Greeson currently teaches health psychology to undergraduates and healthcare models and service delivery to graduate students at Rowan University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Greeson to the podium. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Does that sound okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Um, and thank you everyone for making the effort to uh, come on a rainy, what is it, Tuesday morning? <laughs> um, we're very excited to have the opportunity uh, to talk about the role of mindfulness and, and medicine, a topic near and dear to my heart, um, both in terms of the science and the practice. I uh, have been involved in the science of mindfulness since 97, so 21, almost 22 years, and have been um, practicing mindfulness and meditation myself since 96, so about 22 years, and uh, practicing mindfulness-based interventions with patients since about 2002, so quite a few years for that as well. So I would like to basically share this story about the potential role of mindfulness, um, the science and practice in health and medicine, which I think will be a nice follow-up topic to the Compassionomics talk. Um, that was delivered, and I watched the TED Talk last night. Very compelling, a lot of tie-ins to science, humanism, um, the innate capacity we have to be mindful and to embody that um, for others, including our patients and uh, the potential benefits for mental and physical health in our own life as well. Um, so thank you very much for, for being here. Um, I'm from the psychology department, as Dr. Kim said, and uh, one of my main interests is trying to integrate health uh, and medicine and psychology together. So no one field has to tackle all these um, common costly and comorbid conditions uh, as one field. It's complicated and people need all of our help uh, working together in an integrated fashion. No actual or potential conflicts of interest. And in terms of objectives, um, this is basically the outline of the story. I think this is all very familiar, so I'm gonna toss some softballs to the crowd. Any students or residents that may be in the crowd give a few easy connections between stress and health. That's really the foundation to talk about how mindfulness can help reduce stress and thereby promote health and well-being. And uh, one of the themes of the talk will be that mindfulness practice, um, which is a, we all have the innate ability to be mindful, and the idea is with practice that ability grows stronger and it can be most powerful in high stress groups. And whether that's patients with stress-related mental and or medical conditions, whether it's us as trainees uh, undergoing a professional training process, highly stressful, um, 
And once we get practicing in the field, there's lots of time, economic, um, many different types of pressures that can lead to burnout and high stress levels that can in turn compromise our health, particularly um, chronically over the long term. So a lot of this um, has to do with balance or imbalance, as you'll see as we, as we go through. Um, just to start with, uh, I kind of wanted to include this based on the 40 seconds of compassion uh, from the, the TED Talk. Uh, I've gotten many 40 seconds of compassion from all of these individuals over the last 20 plus years, um, both in terms of cultivating my pursuit of the science and practice of mindfulness. So I just wanted to kind of uh, begin with an acknowledgement of gratitude and mentorship for all of the people that have been instrumental in my uh, personal pursuit of mindfulness and also the, the science and practical applications as well. So thank you to everybody, uh, Jefferson, um, Miami, uh, Duke, Penn, and even now with the Institute for Integrative Health for helping to support uh, my pursuit of, of this work. Um, this is, I remember in high school physics, whenever you saw a pattern that showed an acceleration, it indicated an important phenomenon um, that warranted attention. So the explosion of published research on mindfulness in the last 15 or 20 years um, certainly counts as one such phenomenon. And this was really sparked by a Bill Moyers special in the early 90s called Healing in the Mind. It was a TV program with an accompanying book. And one of the places that they profiled was University of Massachusetts Medical Center where John Kabat-Zinn had started this eight week stress reduction program that was later called mindfulness-based stress reduction to sort of catch patients falling through the cracks of the medical system with chronic pain, um, multiple comorbid conditions, a lot of which um, then and now tend not to respond the best to conventional medical therapies. And this program was really developed as a way to help patients um, care for themselves, manage themselves, uh, tap, utilize, and apply their own inner resources for health and healing, if you will. And uh, subsequently in these last 15, 20 years, as we'll go through in this talk, um, some of my work and a lot of work by others in the field have shown that mindfulness practice can in fact influence the brain, influence behavior, influence biology with potential important implications for both mental and physical health and well-being. So, Back in the you know, 98 and 2000, when we were having journal clubs and reading nine or 10 articles a year, we had our finger on the pulse of the entire field of mindfulness. But now when it's almost 700 papers a year, no one person can keep their finger on the pulse of mindfulness by themselves. So just wanted to start by saying there's been this explosion of uh, research on mindfulness in these last several years. Um, in terms of my personal involvement in this, I've been part of many different teams. Uh, over the last 16 years or so that have gotten quite a few NIH uh, awards and as well as other funding. Um, I've only had to manage 2.8 million of it, so that's a pretty small fraction because I've worked with a lot of good labs and good groups that are doing, but these are all mindfulness projects. And just to give a flavor, um, oops. Uh, sort of from training grants and loan repayment programs, um, enhancing mindfulness for the prevention of weight regain. That was a Duke multi-site trial with Penn and Indiana State. Had a career award to study stress physiology, changes with mindfulness practice and sleep patterns. Uh, this awareness study was in pre-diabetes and depression. The serenity study is with um, pre-hypertension. That's ongoing through May. Diversity supplement for one of my graduate students, Abby Chen. Uh, the LIFT study was for ICU survivors to develop a phone and an app-based mindfulness program, four sessions. Uh, like Compassionomics, um, I thought genomics, proteomics, the inflammasome, the metabolome, the transcriptome, why not mindfulomics? So uh, I'm sort of trying to charter that area. Um, HIV and comorbid conditions. The second version of the LIFT study with the app for ICU survivors, and now we just got funded to do it um, primarily at Penn State and some other sites, mindfulness for diabetes. So, and there are some others, but those are the major ones um, that I've been involved with along the way. Some of those findings are still in the works, um, but just to sort of show the big picture of the type of work I've been involved with over these years. So a few words about stress and health. I think we're all um, probably pretty familiar with this ourselves uh, and or through the type of patients we see. I think we're all, um, uh, plenty convinced that stress does take a toll on our health and it's important because Stress, particularly chronic stress, is a significant barrier to people reaching their health and lifestyle goals. And I think that's one lens through which we can look at 
mindfulness is insofar as stress affects not only your kind of brain and blood pressure and these biological systems that we spend time learning about, it also affects your behavior, your coping style, your habits, your routines. Many of those can become very kind of automatic, habitual, and mindless. Um, and if we bring more awareness to those, they're changeable. If we're not really bringing much awareness to those, we're going to overeat, maybe be inclined to use substances, sleep too much or too little, and so forth. And those behaviors um, have a strong effect on our health. Here, even if you can't read um, all of the axes, basically the red line shows American adults' perception of stress, and the blue or the green line, the gray line, is what they consider a healthy level. So over the last 12 years or so, people are roughly 50% more stressed um, than they feel like is a healthy level. So this is an important trend, just descriptive, but if people are sort of continuously more stressed than they think they should be, and we know that stress affects the brain and behavior in these ways that can in turn affect health, things like mindfulness could be potentially useful for that reason. Um, all right, here's one of the softballs that I mentioned, top 10 leading causes of death in the US. And what I wanna look for here is, well, what's, what's number one? We should all know this, right? Cardiovascular disease. It, it doesn't get at, what's number two? Cancer, still pretty easy. What about the third one? Here's where it gets a little trickier. Sorry? That's actually, that's on the list and depending on how this is defined, it could be. Any other ideas for the third one? Think kind of along those same lines, yeah. Um, accidents, so unintentional injuries would be the overdose, suicide gets a separate line on here, but um, overdoses, things like that, that actually went from number four up to number three in 2016. Um, chronic lower respiratory diseases, anybody know the fifth, sixth, seventh ones? Stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, a seventh and rising. Flu and pneumonia, renal disease, kidney disease, and then here you have suicide. Um, they're all important. I put those two in red just because of um, the ability. Most of these are preventable, especially through lifestyle changes, many of which have to do with stress. Smoking, overeating, poor sleep patterns, a high level of stress activation and stress physiology, which includes the inflammatory response, which is implicated in atherosclerosis. Um, chronic pain, breathing issues, and so forth. But the two in red are especially concerning, um, not only because they're taking a lot of lives, um, but because uh, whatever we're doing now, these are still the third and the tenth leading causes, so it would be nice to be able to do a little bit better um, with that. And I think... Falls come under accidents? Yes, accidents, unintentional falls, overdoses, things like that, but suicide does have its own, its own category here. Um, and I also wanted to show this, I show this in health psychology in my PhD course as well, um, just because if you think about how stress affects these conditions, so just I don't want to perseverate on it, but one or two examples for how could stress biologically and or behaviorally affect some, if not all of the conditions on here. Can you think of an immediate example or two? Increased blood pressure. Increased blood pressure, definitely, which ties into the stroke, the risk of heart attack and so on. Glucocorticoids, and what are you thinking with, with that? So high levels of cortisol. Um, so normally cortisol, like cortisone, is anti-inflammatory, but when it's chronic, the brain and other tissues can downregulate their um, glucocorticoid receptors, permitting chronically elevated levels of inflammation, which ties into a lot of these um, states of pathology as well. Yes, self, if, if people are in a state of discomfort, they're gonna search for some way of feeling more comfortable, and when they find a way that works, they're gonna keep going back to that well, and then it can become chronic, as it does help with that. It's just, we're, if we're doing that, we're usually not thinking about the longer-term consequences. Um, and there are many others, but just suffice to say, uh, there are lots of tie-ins um, to stress, both through biology, but also through behavior, that directly tie into the top 10 leading causes of of death in this country. And so if our goal is working together in the healthcare field is to try and reduce these numbers, try and prevent some of these numbers, I think um, other approaches, potentially mindfulness being one of them, are worth considering. Um, one in five people have mental illness or addiction. 
that's just kind of point prevalence. Over the lifetime, it's almost half of people. So we have to start kind of wondering, you know, what's, what's normal and what's abnormal here, and, and what do we have to offer, you know, to do about this? Pain, um, about 50 million people, uh, about one out of five U.S. adults have chronic pain, persistent pain, or severe pain, which is costing billions of dollars. Um, and uh, mentioning the addiction and kind of the overdose, um, the need for evidence-based non-pharmacologic behavioral therapies like mindfulness and other things or exercise. Um, but mindfulness could also support a lot of these sort of self-management uh, strategies that could be helpful in managing not only the kind of physical sensations of chronic pain, but anybody in chronic pain knows it affects your emotions, it affects your attention, pain takes attention, so it affects your personality or behavior. So it's not that mindfulness is a cure-all for these things, but it can be helpful in terms of helping patients manage. Um, and since one of five people have this, a lot of healthcare providers are in chronic pain as well, not to mention the, the burnout and other issues. So that's a foundation for, for how stress affects health biologically and behaviorally. So that's a um, kind of entree for how mindfulness can influence health. I did want to um, plug this idea, which I think um, was uh, discussed in the last month as well. The quadruple aim of healthcare, that we're trying to aspire for better care, better outcomes, at lower cost, with better patient satisfaction, and also better provider satisfaction. So anything we can do to help um, aspire toward this quadruple aim, that's, as I understand it, in our healthcare models class and uh, with current trends, that's what we're supposed to be aspiring for. So I think uh, mindfulness can support all four of these, as I'll discuss a little bit further. Um, so I'm trying to kind of both in class and through writing and my own sort of personal practice of psychology in these uh, medical settings from Jefferson to University of Miami Medical Center, to Duke for about 10 years and then Penn for three or four and now at Rowan, trying to kind of make these arguments um, both through the science but also kind of health policy and this quadruple aim, the rationale for why we should be integrating different disciplines so that no one profession is expected to do this all by themselves. Um, the particular opportunity uh, that folks in medicine have, Ron Epstein wrote in 99, so it's almost 20 years ago now, so, you know, you're called attending physicians, right? So every physician has, just like all of us, the natural ability to attend. And sort of like mindfulness, that's an innate capacity that every trainee, every student, every resident, every physician has. The key is, is there any sort of practice or method or mechanism for improving that attending ability? And so as Ron Epstein has developed, and I'll go on to show here, there are these training programs, both for residents, medical students, even healthcare providers to help us grow this natural ability to attend. And there are lots of extensions of being able to do that um, better, be it the error rate, decision-making, clarity, um, empathy and sort of compassion and attunement when we're in the room with another person, all sorts of things. But So it's a natural ability that everyone has, and the idea is should there be uh, increasing opportunities to cultivate or grow this natural ability to be an attending physician. So they call this mindful practice. can be done in multiple fields, but it sort of started off in um, appearing in medicine about 20 years ago. So anybody seen this, this slide before? So mind, mindfulness is not the same as mindfulness. So the reason why um, this is a popular slide is it's not just because aren't dogs cute and our pets are so mindful. Um, a couple main points here. So when you see this, the person on the left is in sort of this um, state of maybe chronic stress or worry and hurry. They're out walking the dog in the same surroundings. The sun's out, the trees are there. And all this other stuff is there because they're thinking about things in the future, they're worrying about deadlines that are past, whatever it is, but they're all kind of adding to what's actually there. So that makes it difficult to attend to what's already there when all this other stuff is going on. We do have that ability to kind of, they say, just clear seeing, you know, whether it's surgery, being in the room with someone, delivering a diagnosis, um, noticing our own stress signature in terms of our own kind of bodily symptoms or behaviors, 
that stuff, all that information is constantly happening, but do we have the ability to actually attend to it and receive it? We do, but a lot of times it's kind of being impinged upon by all these other stimuli. So this is important in terms of both mental and physical health. Um, and the mental health side, worrying, ruminating, catastrophizing, things like that, these perseverative types of thinking, not only do things happen in our life, but then we keep them activated in the mind and the brain the more we're worrying and kind of ruminating on it. So it takes something that happens and prolongs or extends it. And in terms of the cortisol levels, the inflammatory response, the blood pressure response, metabolism and so forth, insulin, all those things, they turn on and turn off, but they are turned on in a more prolonged chronic fashion if these kind of events in the mind are continuing to be activated. So you can think of a lot of the patients we see and probably as healthcare providers, we have examples of this ourselves. Um, not only what happens sort of in our life or if we're having health conditions, but also the kind of worrying about it. It's, um, it's not inconsequential because coming through the brain and innervating all the systems of the body, these signals are getting transmitted all the time. So the value of mindfulness has both um, biological uh, and health, um, but also kind of preventive consequences in terms of preventing stress-related conditions. So mindfulness is the ability to be present, see things for what they are, um, and to notice if this other stuff starts happening, but to be able to kind of let that be and acknowledge that while paying full attention to what's actually already there. And again, you can imagine the practical implications of the ability to do that, to apply that, to be able to do that more regular, regularly and routinely uh, as a healthcare provider, but also in terms of caring for ourselves and trying to embody these core qualities of mindfulness to other people. So William James, the father of modern psychology uh, at Harvard said in 1890, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And then he went on to say, but um, we don't know much about how to do that. And so ostensibly um, mindfulness practice is one way to educate ourselves and potentially our patients on how to notice when the mind kind of wanders to these other things um, and is tied to the brain, mental health, behavior and physical health as a potentially modifiable um, factor we can work with. And this also ties to that quality of being in attending. Uh, there's a whole um, neuroscience on mindfulness uh, meditation, prefrontal cortex, the, the limbic system, the amygdala, the insula, um, shifting out of the default mode network was, is associated with depression and PTSD and other conditions to more of the salience or somatosensory networks. A lot of mindfulness practices are more sensory, mindfulness of the breath, mindful eating, mindful movement, somatosensory. Um, so the brain is neuroplastic, even in adults, and so there are these whole special issues now on the neuroscience of meditation. So again, I'm just kind of showing a lot of these screenshots of the study titles in case you're interested. You'll have the slides and you can look this up uh, at your leisure if you so choose. Um, but just suffice to say, there is hard science in terms of um, the plausibility and the premise for how being more mindful, practicing meditation could actually have implications for health rooted in neuroplastic changes in the brain. Um, one of the projects I was involved with as a co-investigator at Duke, um, meditators have stronger functional connections in attention areas of the brain. So if medical students, residents, and physicians were to actually practice meditation, are we able to kind of voluntarily bring back that wandering attention and be more present and focused and compassionate and effective? On the left, you can see the people without the meditation experience, it's a lot of blue. On the right, the meditators have a lot more red across all of these different attentional areas um, that serve attention in the brain. So the takeaway there is the attentional networks are more functionally connected in meditators than in the age and sex matched controls. So cross-sectional study, but supporting this idea that spending time doing meditation can actually strengthen your ability to attend in multiple regions of the brain that subserve attentional processes. Okay, so that's some of the plausibility and premise for how mindfulness could influence health. What are some of the more practical applications in medicine? And I'll just go through a series of studies, many of which I've personally been involved with, um, and then sort of segue from the more patients with stress-related conditions that we're all seeing and that this could potentially help with, uh, with 
students, trainees, um, and physicians and healthcare providers and the potential benefits and payoffs there as well. So mindfulness in medicine. So how many people when you're seeing patients uh, in rotations or as an attending or me in psychology, we see a lot of different disorders. Everything's got a nice diagnostic criteria. Diagnose this. Di Does this look pretty realistic how all these things nicely separate? Or is it a little more like this? These bad things tend to cluster. Um, and again, it sort of goes back to the default mode and how these systems are activated, what's going on in the brain, how does that, you know, those neural systems influence behavior, how do habits get formed versus broken and so forth. So these bad things tend to cluster, and as it turns out, um, mindfulness-based interventions are actually pretty good at these kind of, again, common, costly, but particularly comorbid conditions. If you look for some of the underlying neural, behavioral, and psychological processes, for what connects and why these things co-occur, how can you try and kind of unravel them or reduce or prevent them from happening? And I think uh, mindfulness-based interventions do a particularly good job of that. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. So here's just a bunch of different books. Again, if any of this is of interest, no judgment if it's not, but I'm uh, not you know, a co-author on any of these, so I uh, no royalties or anything here. But these are just good ones in terms of uh, here, <clears throat> this sort of a, uh, UMass eight-week program, the self-help version is in this full catastrophe living book. Then there's offshoots of this eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR course for depression. Um, I think at least eight or 10 or 12 um, trials now have replicated that mindfulness training can prevent relapse of depression to the same rate as ongoing antidepressant, antidepressant medication therapy. So again, we have to remember sort of um, uh, the patient and patient-centered care, remember the person and personalized medicine. If people are very interested in adherence to medication, that is fantastic and that's the right fit for them. If they've tried that, they, a lot of people sort of don't respond too well to that. The search for non-pharmacologic therapies, especially for people that are open and interested in trying it, these behavioral therapies, including some of the mindfulness-based interventions, can help with that, including with things like depression that many people will have in their lifetime and it's also comorbid with uh, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, the diabetes, chronic pain, and, and so forth. Um, I'll talk more about this one, but uh, I've bought it but haven't read it yet. Attending um, Medicine, Mindfulness, and Humanity um, by Ron Epstein. That's the residency program that he and his colleagues at Rochester have developed, and they do trainings on this. You can do continuing education with this. And then there are also now some uh, mindfulness-based, evidence-based mindfulness programs, um, both for enhancing recovery from addiction, um, as well as people currently using various substances, alcohol, cocaine, and multi-substance use. So these are some of the evidence-based uh, mindfulness interventions that are out there that have professional training processes that we can go through and so forth and that have good data behind them. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov and type in, um, we were talking about HIV before the talk got started, chronic pain, insomnia, GI disorders, um, mental health things, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, cardiovascular disease, migraines, and so forth. There are clinical trials happening on mindfulness and all sorts of disorders. And again, kind of like the top 10 leading causes of death, mindfulness is most helpful with stress precipitated or stress exacerbated mental and or medical conditions. So that's sort of the common thread you see when you look across these sorts of conditions that are under investigation, uh, many of which we've looked at in uh, the research I've been involved in as well. Um, the first study we did at Jefferson here, just to this eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program, um, self-pay, improvement in health-related quality of life. So health-related quality of life is a combination of two things, sense of well-being and daily functionality. So taken together, health-related quality of life improved in these um, heterogeneous patients with a variety of stress-related conditions. 28% improvement in self-reported medical symptoms, almost a 50% reduction in anxiety, and the people we were able to contact one year later, many of those benefits were sustained. So um, I'll try and mention some of the limitations of the field as well. The long-term durability of the acute benefits largely remains to be established. So you won't find a whole lot of studies that have sort of one or two year follow up because it is hard to track people over that long a time. It takes more funding and so forth. But that's happening more 
now compared to you know pushing 20 years ago when we were first starting to do this work, but promising you know observational results. Um, we looked at a subgroup of about 100 people that had chronic pain, also from Jefferson's program. So we were looking at variation in treatment outcomes in the role of home practice because everybody can take the same course, but you can have a variety of different outcomes. So it's analogous to if we you know, give aspirin or some other medication. It's not just because this much you know, aspirin is in there, everybody has the same effect. Pharmacogenomics, everybody has a different effect, or not everybody, but there can be very varying effects to the response to medications. Same thing with meditations. So uh, improve mental health, vitality, and bodily pain, and particularly helpful for people with two or more chronic pain conditions. So again, this idea of kind of the clustering, the bad things cluster, it would be nice if we had something that could be helpful for that, and it looks like these mindfulness-based interventions may have a niche for helping with, with those sorts of things. So practical. Uh, more recently, um, a, student, a grad student at Duke and I wrote a chapter on um, mindfulness-based stress reduction for chronic pain. And in there, and I'm happy to, if you email me, I can send you the PDFs to any of these, or a lot of these are on um, the publications tab of, of my lab website, mindfulnesslab.org, if you're interested in finding some of those there. But we wrote about the biological pathways, the neural basis of the pain matrix, how a lot of those areas, both the sensory aspects of pain, the emotional aspects of pain, impulse control and behavior are modifiable through mindfulness training, um, stress physiology, pain sensitivity, coping, uh, the role of the desire for change versus acceptance at times, a variety of different ways that mindfulness can help patients cope with pain we wrote about in, in this chapter. So again, kind of the epidemic proportions of chronic pain and the consequences of um, opioid use, overdose potential, and that rising number of kind of up to the number three leading cause of death in large part due to this. This is something that can be practical and helpful, again, for people that are open, interested, and curious in this if we also have some familiarity or even ideally some maybe type of continuing education or personal experience to be able to share with them to kind of motivate or even guide them in practicing some of these types of uh, mindfulness approaches. So that's chronic pain. Um, JAMA Internal Medicine 2014, very influential and widely publicized uh, meta-analysis. What you can see here, <coughs> I'll walk around. <coughs> they had a couple important tables. I just wanna draw your attention to um, the two tables they had. This is one of them. This is showing mindfulness-based interventions compared to what they call non-specific active control. So that would be things like uh, psychoeducational, group where you're learning about stress and how it might impact a disease or a support group. I mean, these are things that learning about how a condition works and how to self-manage it, that is helpful. Um, skill building, but also in terms of the information and education support groups, that's plenty helpful. But they call them non-specific active controls. And you can see though that in terms of the effect size, the um, meditation conditions were favored almost uniformly uh, compared to those non-specific control conditions. The next graph, which I omitted from here, it's, it's more comparable down the midline when you compare it to active control interventions, which are proven established therapies, medication, exercise, um, active psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy. So one of the conclusions from the press release is mindfulness is no better than active control conditions, but what they kind of left out is medication and exercise and cognitive behavioral therapy, th those are all pretty good. <laughs> so having something that's equally good or no worse than those, maybe it's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. But for I think a lot of people, they might be interested in these mindfulness-based approaches. Again, it depends on, on the person in terms of personalizing medicine. But that was a pretty influential meta-analysis, even though um, people can rightfully <laughs> Uh, debate the meaning of, of those findings. Um, a couple other things here. So uh, American Pain Society, but also American Heart Association are coming out with some consensus statements. So a lot of, um, if you look across the field where we stand right now, there are consistent effects on subjective improvements and stress levels, uh, burden of stress-related symptoms, coping, quality of life, and not to minimize those because for a lot of patients, those outcomes are very important ones. There's a lot less evidence for um, objective, disease-based, objective verifiable symptoms like blood pressure or you know, helper T cell count in HIV or um, particular inflammatory markers or proteins and different um, uh, 
types of arthritis or other conditions. But for the American Heart Association, they looked at all of the evidence and they concluded that there have been a few studies, not with very large sample sizes, not with very long follow-up time, but that have found at least promising potential evidence for reductions in blood pressure across from pre-hypertensive to hypertensive, medicated, unmedicated. Um, there's at least promising evidence. So given the kind of evidence for efficacy coupled with sort of low risk for a lot of these things, it's really just sort of stress reduction learning to become more aware. Um, they're saying that particularly for people that are open to this and for practitioners that are supportive, they're recommending, you know, mindfulness could be having a role in cardiovascular risk reduction for the lowering blood pressure, the other behaviors like diet. A lot of times it's like we don't drink because we're thirsty in terms of alcohol, a lot of the times we don't eat because we're hungry. We eat because it's out of habit or routine and it's typically salty, sugary things, adding to weight and blood pressure. So a lot of those things are kind of more mindless eating type of habits. Sleep, um, video and sort of internet use, a lot of these things can fall under that and indirectly end up influencing our risk for these chronic um, diseases. So partly it can come through behavioral changes uh, that are tied to stress and being able to reduce stress through things like mindfulness. So consensus statements. Um, here's one pilot study from some colleagues at Kent State. What they found was they compared this eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course to progressive muscle relaxation, tensing and releasing the various muscles tried and true relaxation technique, we all learned this. Um, they found that somewhat comparable for the systolic blood pressure change of five points that some medicines and exercise programs, they're in that similar kind of four to nine point range and so was the mindfulness course. So this was only in about 50 people. Now we're doing it in this serenity study, this multi-site trial in Cleveland and uh, here in Philly. So this is the one that ends in May. Um, so we haven't looked at the data yet, but we'll see in a sample of more like 200 people, much more diverse across different cities, if that same effect plays out. So that's how you can use the pilot work to try and pursue kind of larger, more definitive multi-site trials. So that's the role of the Serenity study in this continuum of research on uh, mindfulness-based interventions for stress-related conditions. These are people with pre-hypertension, not yet frank, frank hypertension, so not on anti-hypertensives. Um, um, similar kind of pilot studies, this is just one I was involved with at Jefferson, helping to lower blood pressure but also blood sugar control in patients with type 2 diabetes. There are other more recent studies, including randomized trials. This was just a pilot study observational. Um, basically, the punchline with where the diabetes work stands is a couple examples of better glucose control but much more consistent evidence with lowering stress levels, improving kind of well-being, daily functioning and quality of life, some dietary changes, but also a couple of biomarker changes, but those are less consistent, and that's a common thread across many of the medical conditions to date. <laughs> stress in the immune system. Um, how does stress affect the immune system? This kind of connects with the cortisol question. Where is it? Stress impairs immune function, right? Chronic stress, so we all know that. Um, natural killer cell function, the ability for B cells to produce antibodies, um, et cetera. Except there's another effect of chronic stress on immune function, and that's immune activation or inflammation. So chronic stress in particular has kind of a double whammy effect on immune function. Not only does it suppress immunocellular functioning and thereby increase susceptibility to infection, cold, flu, other things, um, but also on the other side of that, chronic inflammation and immune activation is the last thing you want with HIV because when a virus is in a cell, activating that cell makes it replicate and you get more virus, which is harder to control than if the cells are not as activated. So, and that applies to Epstein-Barr, mono, herpes simplex viruses, HIV. So the immune system needs to be in balance, not suppressed, but also not overactivated, especially with people that have um, viral infections. So there is some um, work going on here. I've been involved in some of it in terms of looking at mindfulness-based uh, interventions effect on both branches of immune functioning and sort of it's a mixed bag. There's some indication that uh, mindfulness and, and yoga programs can lower inflammatory signaling pathways like nuclear factor kappa B. I have another slide on that that mediates pro-inflammatory cytokine production that's associated with arthritis and chronic pain and a whole host of things. Atherosclerotic processes are not only cholesterol, they're also inflammatory processes can influence that. Um, but a lot of the sample sizes are small, no follow-up, um, so it's, it's not definitive at this time. But there's at least kind of a biological plausibility established here. 
Um, this one is a short paper, just two pages, if you're interested in understanding inflammation, its regulation, its relevance for health as a top scientific and public health priority. Um, here's where I mentioned this transcription factor, NF-kappa B. It's been called the holy grail of drug discovery because if we can find ways to attenuate, mitigate, reduce nuclear fac factor kappa B activity and expression, there's a whole hook from cancers to type 2 diabetes to MS to all sorts of things um, that are tied to this rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and, and a subset of kind of genes have been implicated. They're called the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. So if you have chronic stress and adversity, there's a set of about 50 genes that the inflammatory ones are upregulated, the kind of antiviral ones are downregulated, and that's been shown to be kind of a molecular signature of chronic stress in things like low socioeconomic status, trauma and PTSD, lonely older adults, um, caregiver burden, and so forth. So I thought this whole idea of kind of um, mindful omics, what if, mindfulness, what if there's a signature of mindfulness in terms of identifying treatment responders with changes in gene expression? So we looked at this eight-week course. Um, this was at Penn, a pilot study through the Institute for Integrative Health. And what we found here is that <clears throat> we had three blood samples, both pre and post eight-week course, and both at baseline, pre to post, you can see that kind of the expression levels of this cluster of 50 genes went down, and then we took it after a stressor, um, remembering back to a time that made them stressed and angry. When you think back to it today, it still makes you angry, provokes that same response. It went down, and then an hour later, because a lot of these genes getting transcribed, they take hours to play out. Cytokines are still going up two hours after just a brief emotional stressor, and that's just in the lab. Imagine what's happening on an everyday basis. But basically, the punchline of what we found here is this graph was from people that reported at least a 50% increase in mindfulness on this mindfulness questionnaire, which is analogous to being a responder in a depression study. 50% reduction in depressive symptoms, you're considered a treatment responder to medication or psychotherapy. So we kind of took an analogous approach to who's a responder to this eight-week mindfulness course. Not everybody is, but if you were, then you had at all three kind of um, blood work time points, it looked like you know, they were having a reduction in these stress and inflammatory gene um, signaling, which may be a signature of becoming more mindful, if you will, in a group of genes that is known to be tied to a whole host of kind of chronic stress-related conditions. So again, plausibility, it's not saying mindfulness is a cure-all for all these things, but in the earlier phase, you're looking to establish more plausibility. So that's pretty interesting pilot data that we're gonna continue pursuing. In terms of other types of interventions, well, this eight-week class in a kind of brick-and-mortar building, that's outdated. We need, we need internet. We need um, telehealth. We need apps for this, right? Even um, one minute of mindfulness is enough. Heck, just one mindful breath, isn't, won't that do the trick? Well, we're trying to find out because, again, it depends on the person. If, if somebody's not going to be able to access or come to an eight-week class, that's great. There's other kind of more brief things we can do for that, including delivering things through the web or apps. So we're starting to do that kind of work. The punchline here, it's just sort of the field just developing, but offering internet or app-based interventions for cancer, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, epilepsy, cardiovascular disease, um, tinnitus, and traumatic brain injury. Across those conditions, significant alleviation of symptom burden, but again, kind of like the HIV or the immune effects or the cardiovascular, not as much um, evidence for impacting physical signs of disease in those same conditions. Um, one just came out in Thorax, it's in press now, uh, directed by Dr. Chris Cox, um, uh, ICU doc at Duke, and our group here, multi-site trial. Um, we developed an app for four sessions, comparing four sessions of the app, self-directed versus four sessions by phone, comparable effects on coping, quality of life, distress levels, symptom levels. Um, and both of those were better than sort of a, a post-ICU discharge educational control. So only a few sessions can be helpful, but you gotta, again, remember what the patients are going through. They have, you've been intubated, you almost die, PTSD. Is it only kind of anxiety meds or what else can we do you know, for folks like this? So again, if they're open to something like mindfulness, this could be helpful. <clears throat> Last segment here, mindfulness for physicians including along the whole training continuum and also other healthcare providers as well. 
So um, I was going to play this video, but if you look it up on this website, it's two minutes. I don't want to um, just for sake of time getting started a little bit after the hour. There's this idea of, of attending. Innate skill, we all have it. We wouldn't have gotten into medicine or healthcare if we weren't already pretty good at it, most probably. Four key skills, being able to attend. He, he also talks about being curious, um, open-minded. The idea of beginner's mind, which is a lot of practice gets wrote after five years, 10 years, 20 years, but how can we take that beginner's mind you know, attitude as we enter each patient, patient's room? The ability of kind of the gift of being present, if you will, um, and again, as to last month's talk, there, there are actual tangible, you know, economic, medical outcome, um, not to mention the psychological and interpersonal factors of being able to be present and be, um, show compassion to someone. So I think these four key skills of, as he talks about being a good attending, has direct implications for caring, connection, and quality and satisfaction. And now we're looping back into this whole idea of the quadruple aim in healthcare that we're all aspiring to pursue together. Um, I threw Cooper on here too, even though we haven't, we're starting the, the Koru mindfulness classes, I think, Emma here at Cooper. Um, but we were doing some of this work at Jefferson and Duke med schools, medical students, you know, they're all stressed and the coffee only, you know, goes so far. So a couple of the things we found at Jefferson some years back, the students in their second year that elected to take the eight week mindfulness course for credit, well, they, it's self-selected. So they're starting off at a much higher kind of distress level compared to the students that elected to take introduction to complementary and alternative medicine. But over the course of the same semester that second year, the students in the complementary and alternative medicine class went from about a 27 up to a 37. The students taking mindfulness started higher, but actually went down in their distress level over the very same semester, same courses, same school, same point in time. So it is actually possible to kind of modify the experience of stress and distress um, because we get good at what we practice. So if we practice being the same old, same old way, that's gonna have some implications. If we practice kind of other ways of seeing and other ways of being, our quality of life and stress levels can be a lot more manageable. And in terms of academic performance, being present for patients and quality of care and so forth, these are not inconsequential implications we're talking about here. Um, we did a, that was a whole semester long thing. A four week group um, for Duke medical students what we found here is that they did have a significant reduction in stress, but this one we also found a significant increase in mindfulness, and the greater reduction in stress they had, the more mindful they became. And again, it's correlational, so we don't know if the less stressed we are, the more we're able to be mindful, and or the more we're able to be mindful, the less stressed we are if it's kind of a two-way street there. But that's what we found in a sample of about 45 um, medical and MD-PhD students at Duke. Um, I think one of the most powerful things from that study, if you just take a moment to read a couple of these quotes, were the qualitative findings, because it's not just scales and whether it's questionnaires or biomarkers, it's actual people's experiences. And we had a self-care goal that we didn't pick. We let the students pick it. And they would say things like, I'm calling my parents again now, or I started going to church again, or I actually, you know, eat breakfast in the morning. I mean, such simple but yet meaningful things in terms of what's meaningful to them, nourishment on multiple levels. But if you don't do a mixed method study and get their kind of first person, first hand narrative account, you miss things like this. So I think some of the qualitative studies are also pretty illustrative for um, what's, what can potentially change with even brief mindfulness training as well, particularly under stressful circumstances. So. Stress, sleep, eating habits, kind of personally meaningful things in life. They were citing a lot of things like that, which was powerful to see. Um, this four session Koru study, which, which was offered to both undergrads, but also medical students, law students, business students, graduate and professional students. Um, the green box here just shows that almost across the board with one or two exceptions, um, compared to a waitlist control group of people that got it later on in the semester, the next semester, lower stress levels, better sleep, but also increases in self-compassion, which again, this whole compassionomics, you know, thing, can we actually train people to be more compassionate toward themselves and others? And it looks like even pretty briefly um, with a spectrum of students that that actually is possible using a randomized trial design. Um, for the physicians, I, I just sort of highlighted, I mentioned these kind of four key skills. We all have the innate abilities to be mindful and compassionate. 
it can in ways get trained out of us just given the kind of systems through which we have to train and, and come through and practice within. But there are these continuing education opportunities. I think they do workshops, invited workshops, so that may be possible here. But they also talk over here about the role of healthcare institutions in supporting us as a workforce to enhance our capacity for resilience while improving the quality of care, reducing errors, burnout, and attrition. So again, tying this ability of mindfulness and to practice mindfully both our own personal practice of mindfulness, but also healthcare and medicine as a practice to practice more mindfully. And could that be a part of uh, this <coughs> quadruple aim? There's the website for mindful practice if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, they've done their own research too, and here it just shows that they had reductions at two sites. Um, it's important to replicate things across sites because just one site, it could just be a fluke. You start seeing things replicated across, across sites in multiple studies, it's more convincing. So less emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, a greater sense of personal accomplishment, less burnout, significantly less at both of these sites with the kind of uh, attending or the mindful practice program. Um, so mindfulness overall is, is helpful in reducing stress levels and helping our functionality, well-being, and quality of life across different, including medicine, but also psychology, social work, and other uh, substance use counseling and nursing and other fields, but more high quality research is needed. So with that curve of all the mindfulness studies, there's been an explosion of studies on mindfulness, but what most of the reviews will tell you is we don't need more studies on mindfulness, we need better quality studies on mindfulness. And I think it's not just with the mindfulness field, the same issue applies in many fields, but it, it also applies in the field of mindfulness. So that's a point well taken for me. Um, how does it work in terms of these pathways? Just one last thing. Mindfulness it has to do with attention, right? So better able to control attention, bring back the wandering mind, be present, be able to regulate emotions, not have the mindfulness, be able to be more mindful, present, and clear. That also comes through a greater sense of self-awareness. What is on our mind at times? What is our body trying to tell us? What kind of behavioral impulses and routines do we tend to develop in terms of how we cope with stress? To be able to better regulate the mind, brain, body, and behavior to ultimately be able to influence um, mind-body health. So in summary, um, mindfulness has a lot to do uh, with self-care, as part of healthcare, this idea of balance. We know stress, especially chronic, affects health. Mindfulness can help reduce stress, alleviate symptom burden, and increase resilience. And mindfulness training is especially valuable for these high stress groups, including medical patients with all these stress-related conditions, but also including ourselves, particularly during the training process, but even when we're out practicing ourselves as attendings, um, as well as sort of a community of healthcare providers in this role of maybe uh, cultivating more mindful institutions to help us sort of tap this innate ability we have to be mindful to be able to apply that to help meet the quadruple aim. Um, so to have a non-pharmacologic approach and whether it's for pain and addiction, mental health, behavioral change, et cetera, I think can be a nice way to uh, integrate that in with medicine. And also this role of self-management, participatory medicine. What can we offer, especially if we have some familiarity with it ourselves, to patients and people to be able to do something to help uh, take care of themselves. So that again, it's not all burdening us to have to change everyone else. So I think those are some of the payoffs of this. And I think the bottom line here is <clears throat> in terms of stress and pain and suffering, we can't stop those ways, but we can definitely learn to surf. And um, with that, I thank everybody very much for coming and for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Greeson. Can take one or two questions from the audience. Um, I see how this is useful for uh, individuals in a you know physician patient dyadic kind of relationship. Do you see a role for mindfulness skills as a public health measure, like vaccination or sanitation or indoor plumbing, in terms of its uh, global effect on the health of the body politics? Yeah, uh, I, I do think there is a parallel there. Um, I've heard it kind of argued that with going from these eight week courses, a couple hours a week, meditating an hour a day at home, a lot of people find that not realistic. Now of the ones that can sort of self-select to do that, that's probably the most powerful. Now it's sort of four weeks, apps, just a reminder for the Apple Watch to buzz. Oh, I got, 
okay, be aware of a breath every now and then. That's more analogous to kind of the um, inoculation, vaccination, if you will, I'll get a little bit of mindfulness pushed out to as many people as possible. So I think there is some value to that, um, particularly insofar as things like that, these kind of push notifications with tech, a lot of this has to do with how stress affects, it's, it's habit interruption. If we can interrupt people's, <laughs> when we're in the worry and hurry and the mindfulness, what, whatever ways we have to kind of, on a public health level, do that, I think that could be powerful because it's really just you know, a habit interruption and giving people more of a chance or an opportunity or a space to realize what's happening and then through that self-awareness be able to potentially do something differently. So I think kind of both the kind of public health apps and push notifications as well as the longer sort of deeper training, they're both potentially helpful. That's a good, good point. Yes, I'll repeat it just so, and thank you all for coming. I know I went right up until a minute or two after, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, and follow up with me if you have any questions. So this, this is an important point. I didn't have a slide on it, but it's an important point. Stress isn't bad, stress isn't evil, especially acute stress that can increase performance. There's the yerkes dodson curve where no stress is not where optimal performance lies, whether it's athletics, medicine, parenting, or anything else some stress is associated with peak performance, but then it reaches a state of diminishing returns where it can go off that cliff with increasing levels of persistent or chronic or more severe stress, then those things start to decline. But the point is optimal performance in medicine or sports or anything else is directly dependent on some degree of stress, that is true. Um, so it's definitely mindfulness is not about eliminating stress or, oh, I was so mindful today. I wasn't stressed at all. I was real relaxed. Well, mindfulness isn't relaxation spelled differently. We can be real relaxed on the beach and we're off in la la. Well, we're not very present. I mean, that's great to be nice and deeply relaxed and there's benefits to that, but we can also be highly stressed and anxious and surgery or like the whole family, what do we do? But also be very mindful and present in the face of that because kind of mindfulness like love, it's unconditional. Mindfulness is a kind of way of seeing or way of being that doesn't depend on the conditions being right. If we gotta be more relaxed or more stressed or clear the mind or be in a less harried you know, situation. That's the whole idea of we can attend, but if we practice it, that ability is gonna grow stronger so that when we are in situations like that, as a medical provider, personally, as a parent, whatever it might be, sports, we can kind of be in that another flow state, if you will. We're taking things as they come. It's as if things kind of slow down and we're able to kind of execute and deliver the skills we have available in a more mindful way, even and especially in conditions that are highly stressful and anxiety producing. Um, emergency responders, surgery. I mean, you can think of all kinds of conditions where we're actually utilizing that for optimal performance, it doesn't necessarily have to be a barrier or a hindrance. So I think that is an important, vitally important clarification. Thanks. Yeah. Can you provide any uh, comment on collective mindfulness activities and the efficacy of teamwork and collaboration? Yeah. So um, the sort of idea of, uh, as Ron Epstein is big on, and we are big on it at Duke Integrative Medicine too. If you rely on every individual to practice mindfulness, well, we should also all exercise and lose weight and sleep another half hour and meditate every day. It's more supportive to do it as a collective. Meditation practice, like a lot of other things, Tai Chi, whole you know, communities do it. That's for a reason. Communities sit together in meditation, people work out together, there's sports that are in team. The collective supports that practice. You know? So I think that is an important aspect. And how it can play out in office practice is, um, this kind of going back to the 40 seconds of compassion where they kind of did the, where you read the kind of takes 40 seconds to express. Same thing with if I'm lucky, 50 minute hour in psychology. I have 50, so I would take the first minute or we talked about this at Wharton last two Fridays. Can we start off a meeting if we have an hour with one minute of just kind of trying to corral and be present 
well, the remaining 59 minutes or 29 minutes are gonna be qualitatively different than if we don't do that. And we're all there, but we're really not all there. That has a lot to do with kind of efficiency and productivity and connectivity with each other and all that. So I definitely think kind of developing and figuring out some ways to collectively be mindful um, is especially powerful. Yeah, and, and it's kind of, I think some of the leaders here are encouraging institutions to, you know, if we wanna be leaders, consider, it's not a ha mindfulness is voluntary, not mandatory. That's another important part of all this. So despite all this stuff, it's not like we all, now we have to be mindful. That's sort of against the whole part. Of, but if there are, is a group of people that are interested, it can be very helpful to kind of mutually support one another collectively, um, like you're saying. Yeah, and I saw you had your hand up as well. Thank you. Yeah, so for a complete novice to this, this whole concept, what would you recommend as a stopping point to you know, begin to be oriented to? A starting point would be, um, if I had to pick one starting point, and Emma, you could help me out with this, learning to become more mindful, it's great to read up on it and to go talks and all, but actually, it's like anything else. We want to practice medicine. We want to practice being mindful. So there are kind of these apps. Headspace is one where there are, I think, six free kind of modules before it becomes subscription. But it's, it's well done. And so there's some kind of animated videos and some practices. But if you go to Headspace, it's a web base or an app, Headspace. That's one where before you have to pay, you get access to some kind of basic practices that once you do those, you can do them on your own anytime you want, but it's kind of brief meditations. But the guy, Andy Puttycomb, who does it, he's very good and kind of makes it interesting and practical. But it's training all these same skills, attending and compassion and being present and being able to respond rather than react. Just, that's all in there. So that's a practical way to learn. And then you can sort of just take that and go, or there's always other apps or other courses and stuff, but that headspace would be, if I had to pick one place to start, would be a, probably a good one, but I'll also let um, Emma. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Emma. I'm Jeff's grad student. Um, I would say, I guess I would echo, start practicing. Don't, don't worry about reading about practice. It's important, but um, not nearly as essential as actually doing the practices. Headspace is great, and then I would also say, because of where we live, there are so many opportunities to practice in community here in, in Philly, and, and like Jeff was saying, that is really, really supportive. So there are courses, there are meditation centers in Center City, Philly, that offer how to meditate courses every week. We can read them in the book. Yeah, we can definitely. Um, time challenge. Wherever you go, there you are. Yes. The, 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 the time thing is, and, and Dr. and Ron Epstein talks about this too. I don't have time to be mindful or compassionate. We all, we all think that, because in terms of thinking, maybe that's true. In terms of being, it's not actually true. And the reason is, um, as we take a very practical example, going in the door you know, to see, see a patient, right? Well, there's, there's a physicality to that act. There's feeling the hand on the door. You hear the same thing with feeling the hands on the finger wheel, or <laughs> hands on the steering wheel, sorry. Um, or when we're eating, can we actually feel the utensil or the food as we're kind of, you know, so like the embodying mindfulness, like in a given moment, are we actually there or are we going in, but we're kind of still thinking about the last, you know, then the, how are you doing? And we're kind of like partly there, but partly not. So there's those kind of in the moment, um, ways to connect with either, some people say like when I go through the door, that's kind of my you know, transition and I'm fully in there, but it also helps to have a physical thing, feeling the door or the chart or now they're electronic or in the car or even you know, just walking. If you're conscious of it, you can kind of feel it, like each step, like each breath, or I've heard athletes or surgeons, you know, they're actually noticing their breathing at times. Any of those kind of physical senses, when you're aware of those at the moment, you have to be there because that's happening and you're noticing it. So that means you're there. So apps or no apps or books or no books, that's basically the heart of it is all this stuff's already happening. It's all taking time, but can we just be aware? Basically mindfulness is, are we aware of what's happening while it is happening? And whether it's that type of stuff, whether it's the breath, eating, talking with someone in the, if we're aware of what we're doing while we're doing it, that basically is being mindful, we're fully present and connected, and that's really the heart of it. Yeah. Question. Um, what's your opinion on how close or how far away we are from having this research have an impact on the day to day and having behavioral health and other, you know, real interprofessional care in the clinical setting? 
about 22 years ago when I started practicing meditation in 90, winter of 96. I thought, oh, we're a few years away from having enough data once it goes from observational studies to randomized trials and then multi-site. We're gonna have plenty of data. It's gonna become part of evidence-based practice. But of course, practice isn't only and solely dependent upon science and evidence. <laughs> it's not that simple. There are cultural things, there are values, there are economic incentives, there are what's reimbursed, there's, there's all sorts of stuff that gets tied into what actually becomes evidence-based practice because a lot of practice isn't evidence-based, over half, you know, I've heard. So, so what does it take to actually get enough data to become part of evidence-based practice? It takes a culture that's receptive. It takes a degree of evidence that's convincing enough using the most rigorous research methodology. And in terms of medicine, that's usually clinical trials, multiple sites, not dozens of people, hundreds of people that are pretty diverse so that the results are generalizable with objective, not subjective outcomes, with follow-up, not just right after a four session. And there isn't a whole lot of evidence on that level. It's growing, but it's, that's kind of a weakness. So I think you put kind of the, prevail, the predominant cultural values, which are kind of do more with less and kind of more is, but that's sort of the opposite of single tasking, which is what mindful single tasking, well, how's that worth it? Well, because of this whole rationale, you know. However, that's not the prevailing kind of cultural paradigm or value. So that makes it hard. Um, the, the kind of uh, insurance companies will say, well, the evidence isn't replicated for a given condition, you know, so that's kind of their threshold for, then it's sort of the, I didn't show any of the data here, but on cost effectiveness, which really you need to help move the needle for health policy change, there's been one or two um, cost effectiveness studies on mindfulness, but only one or two. I'm sure there are more in the pipeline, but there are those gaps right now, even 20, 25 years into this, which is relatively nascent, um, but it's a kind of slow moving process. So I think, and there's probably other reasons besides those, but those are a few of them. Negative side effects of mindfulness. Yeah, I actually just tweeted, uh, there, there are now uh, Willoughby Britton at Brown um, encouraging meditators as people, meditation instructors, retreat centers, healthcare providers to um, not kind of suggest or put the message out, which I may have inadvertently done somewhat, that meditation is a euphoria, it's, it's good for everybody, it's a cure-all. Well, it can be, the joke with this eight-week course is it can be called mindfulness-based stress production instead of mindfulness-based stress reduction. And the reason why is the time issue. How am I gonna find 45 minutes a day to meditate? I gotta see all these patients, I got kids, blah, 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 all these roles, and that is true. Not to mention these rates of chronic pain, trauma, um, sexual assault, violence, over to, there are a lot of people out there that have had traumatic experiences. And they're supposed to sit down and go, oh, I'm being a little facetious because that's not what mindfulness is like actually, but or lay down and do the body scan and feel all the air. It's just feeling what's already there, but you're noticing what's there without, and it can be uncomfortable and it can sometimes provoke kind of untoward reactions of people can get anxious or kind of feel an area that's bothered. At first, practicing this can be a little harder because we are becoming more aware of what's already there. What's already there might not be the sun and the two trees and the dog's wagging its tail and everything's hunky. What if what's there is all the other stuff? And now you're becoming more aware of that. That's not easy to do, so that can cause more stress and anxiety, potentially even kind of reveal things that people have been working to sort of work through or get past. That is where having a credible, well-trained instructor matters. It's like any other relationship, your kind of chemistry or trust you know, with them is really important. Not kind of overdoing it or expecting to, to do too much and just honoring when things like that happen. It's okay, you know, kind of a lot of um, change processes or even healing are nonlinear. You know, it hurts before, it hurts a little before it gets better. That's kind of a natural healing phenomenon. Again, surgery or a little cut, that same thing with meditation sometimes or therapy. So um, framing it like that, I think is helpful, not to sell it as a panacea or a cure-all, because that's certainly not the case, but also to fully acknowledge, you know, not to scare people off, but just to openly acknowledge that that stuff can happen. A lot of the courses, uh, I don't know of the ones, Emma, you're teaching, but um, have kind of these um, 
they used to be required, now maybe they're more elective. You can come in, meet your instructor, meet the people that are gonna be in the group before you decide to do it. So that kind of trust building and comfortability matters a lot. Um, but that stuff can, can maybe kind of get uh, taken out in the name of efficiency sometimes with these shorter programs and stuff. So I think that's a key point and the, the good, better, credible people will always try and acknowledge things like that and support people of whatever their path or starting point is, even if it's sort of up and down. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think the Scandinavian countries and England have probably done the most. Now, there could be other ones in countries where I don't read the I don't speak or read the language, um, but I do know that I've seen quite a few: uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Oxford, um, Exeter. They're having a lot of research coming out of those countries and centers in particular. Um, so those are a few names of places you could look up and I'm sure there must be other ones that maybe if, if they're publishing in English, that's great. If they're not, maybe other people that speak those languages could find that. But I think it is happening more kind of Europe for sure. I'm less familiar with kind of other countries doing it. There are a couple of good uh, mindfulness people, I think two or three in Australia, you know, doing really good stuff. So. There is stuff happening elsewhere. It's not all and only in the, in the states. Thank you, Dr. Greeson. If you have additional questions, certainly feel free to come up and- Thank you for going over. I apologize for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.